Okay, so hi. I'm Vilos uh, from uh, Vilnius Wix Engineering Office. Um, I'm working for Wix as software engineer for like four years already, uh, whereas I started as Scala developer, JVM. Uh, but after I guess like a year and a half, I discovered this uh, neat language JavaScript and uh, Node.js, and uh, I really kind of liked it. And uh, ever since, I was working basically uh, with a Node and front end and actually really, really enjoying that. So today, uh, I'm gonna talk about this long sentence, which I guess you can read more like this, because it's quite loaded, but, but you know, bear with me, we'll decompose it, uh, and I'll explain it step by step. So in those many words, there is a word module. What is it? Uh, modular programming, according to Wikipedia, is a software design technique that emphasizes separating the functionality of a program into independent and interchangeable modules such that each contains everything necessary to execute only one aspect of the desired functionality. It's all clear, right? Uh, in essence, I mean, we all do that. We consume, we produce, we break up our code or apps into modules, be it a file, function, object, or NPM module, which uh, you all will know. But uh, main traits of the module is that it encapsulates code and data to implement some functionality. It has a clear interface through which you can communicate with it. Uh, it's easy, pluggable, and uh, you know, replaceable with another module, given contracts match. And it's usually packaged in a single unit. So, NPM, microservice, uh, or you know, char in main for that matter. So this is a module. Um, NPM, do I have to explain it? <laughs> I guess not in this crowd. I mean, this talk is actually for mixed audience, so you know, I had to, I, I figured I have to uh, go through all of it, but um, so I work with, with other uh, package managers or, you know, like Maven and etc. And what, what I really liked about NPM and where I see its really power is that there is really e easy entry. I mean, if you're, you know, fast with your fingers, in a minute you can go from nothing to a published module. And like consuming module is even faster. Semantic versioning is, is really amazing, really simple uh, in its core, but really amazing idea. Well, sometimes it fires back at us, you know, when, when somebody breaks that contract, but otherwise it's really powerful and also isolation. So in Node.js, uh, you can have uh, multiple versions of same module in your you know, module graph, and it's fine. It's business as, as usual. You know, try to do that in JVM, and it's, it's, it all falls apart. Monorepo. So Monorepo is a single repository holding code of multiple projects, which can or but must not be uh, related in any way. So if you have um, a piece of code composed from you know multiple uh, modules or pieces that you need to maintain. So there, there is the classical approach, how to work with it. So have each module in separate repository and uh, you know you do change in one place, you do publish in another place, but um, it's sort of hard and it doesn't scale well and Monorepo actually you know, allows it to, to have many of those in one place and where you can, wait, sorry, <coughs> where, where you can have actually a single lint build and test process across a graph or group of modules, uh, it's much easier to coordinate changes because you can actually do, you know, atomic change that touches on multiple modules. And you don't have to coordinate releases or versions or, or anything. Uh, you also can kind of set up your uh, development environment so if the, the thing is composed of multiple, it now has a place where you can you know, place your 
set of declarations because if all modules are in separate repos, you know, where do you define how to build them, link them, on, or how to work with them? And you can also, of course, run tests across all of them. Now there is this number 140. So what is this thing? So uh, when I said, you know, I worked for some time uh, with Node.js, I guess a couple of years now. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later, but, but you can see it as everything Node at Wix. So it's uh, both... Uh, so initially Wix was a JVM shop in the backend. So if you wanted to write a service, you used JVM, Scala or Java. Uh, and uh, a couple of years ago, we introduced a new stack, so you can write node services and, and run them in production. And uh, and in two years, basically, you know, we we build it, and it's now composed of uh, main. So it's Bootstrap, which is a runtime, like a framework. I guess it's not popular anymore to call things frameworks, uh, platforms or something. But but basically, it's something that developers take. They add their code, you know, business code, and it takes care of you. Uh, all the monitoring, all the, you know, uh, production deployment, configuration, everything. Uh, then there are 20 something uh, bootstrap plugins. So say, you know, you, you write a service and you want to have like MySQL. You know, you, you want to access MySQL. So you take one of those plugins, add it to bootstrap, it's an NPM model, obviously. And you have like zero configuration. You, uh, you can, I mean, you don't need to set up databases, anything. Uh, all the connection pools, monitoring, uh, configuration, injection, production, everything is taken care of. Uh, then there are 30 something test kits for anything you might need. Uh, and also 30 something opt-in modules. This could be um, some express middlewares. We use express. Uh, if you need it, this could be login libraries or just something that you know you, you sometimes might need. You know, but like why? You know, th th this doesn't look like the f you, you could maybe package it into one thing, right? One module. Then there is nothing to manage. Uh, but so I didn't want to torture my users, you know, and giving them some huge piece of code that takes forever to install, for example. Uh, and also I feel like the, the NPM model is a really, really good uh, building block, especially like in dynamic languages uh, like JavaScript, because it has really clear contract. And uh, I believe, you know, I, I personally suck at writing huge code bases. I, because usually when, when I try to do that, it ends up being like a spider web or net or, or mess eventually. Because you have business pressure, you know, you need to deliver, and this initial model kind of falls apart. Now with many models, you cannot cross boundaries, you cannot really do hacks, because you have just, just contract that you can access. And, uh, you know, in two years, uh, it turned out quite well for me, at least, you know, the way I see it, because it actually composed into quite nice graph. If I would visualize it, uh, it worked uh, really nicely. And also, you know, NPM allows you to keep it uh, really cheap. Installs are fast nowadays. Uh, but, but, but it comes uh, at a price. Because, you know, you, you need to manage it. To, to, to be able to, for it to be workable. And when I talk about managing, I mean that uh, for me, as developer working with this beast, uh, I want to have experience uh, pretty much the same as if I would be working with one model. So no extra effort in some, you know, bumping versions, adjusting, tuning, linking, or something. Um, and let me tell you now the story of how it all went. So the, the models, you know, this 140 didn't happen overnight, obviously, right? It was, you can see that it was, it was quite linear with some bumps and, and downs, you know, some 
I guess, Christmas vacations, less of the modules created. This is, you know, new modules created, basically. Uh, during that time, uh, multiple of tools uh, were created and, and uh, bootstrap at some point was <coughs> composed from the modules. And basically, the tools are there to, to manage the thing. As well as there were some uh, external factors that happened. Uh, for example, at some point in time, you know, Lerna was released. Who knows Lerna? Good, some of you do. So Lerna is an open source, uh, basically, tool to manage those, you know, uh, monorepos with many modules. Uh, then npm5, yarn, some, some, some serve, you know, as inspiration, some I could just take and use, and some, some work as like npm5, for example, was basically a free put, because it really sped up uh, npm installs, uh, and some were actually complications along the way. Now when we started, uh, it was uh, like free developers, but it stopped working. So I'll just have a sip, you know, so... So when we started, we were just uh, free developers and we were just, you know, it was amazing. No users, no nothing, just prototyping, creating modules, doing whatever we felt like. And the initial steps were basically to build some building blocks. Uh, to see if we could actually run Node in production. And these were mostly to cover integrations towards our deployment system, towards JVM uh, existing platform. It was a lot of fun, you know, you publish from local host, no rules, no management, nothing. It was really, you know, joyful times. Now, at around 21 modules, uh, it works now? Start with lighting it without you know, this thing. So at around 21 models, uh, they actually started to connect. So meaning just from a bunch of you know standalone experiments and models, they started forming a graph. So you know A depends on B and B on C. And then we got into works on my machine syndrome. So as I mentioned, there were like three developers. So you know. I change something in one module, break its contract, I push, another developer pulls, links, tries to do his work, and now it doesn't work because I just broke it. And you know, we started doing the same uh, for each other, which was not, it started getting painful. Um, but a couple of things happened at that time. So at that same time, uh, there was another project in Wix that started using Node and uh, NPM and sort of felt similar pains before us. And then, you know, they just stepped up and create, uh, created a WNP release. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a tool which you plug in into pre-publish. And what it does is uh, when you When you pub, like uh, when CI builds your module, uh, it looks up already published version that determines a new one and published published. So you don't have to you know think about like version management or version bumping anything. What happens? You just push your code to CI, and versions are bumped. So uh, this this uh, issue was solved. And uh, also, at that time, we got uh, CI support in Wix. We, we use internal CI system. So uh, that would support monorepos. So again, I push to master, and uh, our CI, what it does, uh, it breaks up the, the monorepo modules into separate builds, uh, links, links them according to dependency graph, and builds it all. Uh, so it didn't really... Uh, solve any of our issues, but it gave us visibility. So when I push some code, CI now is red, and uh, you know, my, my colleague uh, knows who to blame, basically. So, you know, it was improvement over nothing. But then we had the issue, you know, how to not to push breaking changes.
And then we wrote a tool. It was before Lerna and anything like that existed. And we wrote a tool bbuild. So uh, it was a CLI tool. It, it could build like multiple uh, platforms as a single grab. But it worked really nice for us. So basically you run it into root, in the root of your mono repo. It uh, that, like recursively finds your modules, builds a dependency graph, top sorts it, and, and respecting it, you know, runs a fixed life cycle. Basically install, build, test. So then, you know, what then happens is that before pushing to master and breaking CI, I, I could uh, verify changes uh, on my machine. So, you know, I might break master, but, but now I have all the tools needed to, to be you know, a nice guy and not, not annoy others. Another problem, you know, when you, when you work with many modules is uh, how, to, how to work with your ID. Because with one module it's really simple, you know, uh, Sublime, Wix Code, IntelliJ, whatever you take, they, they support it quite well. When you have, uh, I guess, at around 23, 48 modules, it got really annoying. Because, you know, you, you want to work with them as, as like a single code base, mostly. Um, and, and neither of those uh, supported such, such a working mode. So you open one module, do a change there, open another, and then it was terrible. Uh, guess what we did? We wrote a tool. I mean, this, this will keep repeating. Uh, so basically we wrote a tool uh, that would... Uh, so my, my tool of choice is IntelliJ or WebStorm. Some of you might hate it, well, what, what can I do? Uh, but what it did, it basically, by using internals of vBuild for graph discovery, uh, we were just generating IntelliJ project, whereas you, you can load it you know, as a single graph, you, you have refactoring, you have uh, code search, and it would generate all the, for example, run configurations for all the modules to run tests. So again, uh, it was improvement, and you know, I didn't feel a discomfort, again, if I would be working with one or 48. At around the same time, uh, we stopped playing games, and basically, uh, created a first composition of those modules, or a thing like a bootstrap, uh, a thing that our users can take and run, like write services and run in production. So you know this is where all those building blocks kind of connected. And and uh, you know in Wix, front the developers like raced ahead and started writing uh, Node.js services. It was like a freedom moment for them. And then uh, we got into sort of version hell because at around 50 models, I guess. Because again, when you have one module, you have single package JSON, you can see all the dependencies, dev dependencies, and you know, managing versions, updating versions, it's like it's a no, right? You just up the version, you, you run test or install test, and it's all nice. When you have 50 package JSONs, well, it, it becomes quite interesting. Uh, you could kind of still do, you know, with fine replace, but I didn't feel it sustainable. So we wrote the tool by using bbuild in, internals. Uh, now the API was really terrible. I mean, now when I look at it, you know, I feel a bit ashamed. But basically, what it did, you know, you run the tool, export to text file, which is actually JSON. Uh, and you have the state dumped. So in my um, mono repo, this module is using Mocha version 2.3.4, this module is 2.3.3, and in registry, the latest is 2.4.5. Now what I used to do, basically, you know, okay, so I want to update only chai to control, you know, updates. So I change the file to this, I want all the modules to use version of chai this, and I run import. And then it just runs and applies this to, to all the modules where it finds the chai. Again, it was annoying, I could say, 
but it, it was way better than, than, than nothing at that time. So uh, first, developers wrote services, deployed to production, and gave us feedback. It was sometimes positive uh, on the you know bootstrap and the thing we created, but not in all the instances. And you know I again looked at it and I figured uh, we need, like some things really just don't make sense how I did them, you know how I did those. Uh, and really the the this is where this 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 module bunch of modules and graph really helped me. Because in like two weeks, uh, I think I took and, and rewrote the, the composition. And I, I don't recall, you know, really well, but, but basically only like five underlined mo modules changed the APIs, which I, where I needed to tune, you know. Uh, but otherwise it was just, just, just new, new composition module, and that's it. And uh, this is this is just a glimpse. You know the, the thing is really stupid. Uh, you have entry point where you require ng, use some plugin, tell where your app is, and your app is basically just exports a function where it gets express app. You, you wire your stuff up, and that's it. This is how much our developers need to write uh, to run Node uh, services in production with with a lot of stuff. Uh, with it added. Whew. At around 80 modules, the thing was taking me around 4 to 5 minutes to build. So if I clone the repo and I run this bbuild thing, uh, it used to take 4 to 5 minutes. Which, which like, I, I didn't do that often. Usually it's, it's you know, just uh, because Build uh, supports incremental builds. So if I run it once and I run it second time, it's a no op because it already you know has a mark that it builds stuff. If I change some module, it builds only subgraph. So so you know it wasn't like usual case where I build it all. It was just change something, build subgraph, push and and uh, move on. But it was still like it was like I couldn't accept it. And I looked at what, you know, why it was slow. So for, for one thing, uh, npm install even a no op, so it's fixed workflow for every, you know, when it builds a module that's install, build, test. So even no op npm install can take three to 10 seconds, I think. Uh, also it's like sequential execution uh, where you know you might not be able to, to parallelize tests, but install is easily parallelizable, and even uh, it had a feature to that each module can use different node version by NBM, which I didn't need. And it's again I looked at it; it was three seconds penalty per module. So. Uh, I looked at it, you know, it, it didn't make sense, and also uh, Lerna was already released at that time, so I had some, you know, some places to look for inspiration, and I did rewrite it. You know, this, this keeps continuing. I took some, some inspiration from Lerna, from Maven, uh, from, from the tool set that I, I already had, which had, ter you know, terrible APIs. Uh, and I actually even took took the code from Bbuild, but I tuned it to, to you know to, 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 to my use case and how I work with it, and uh, the, the the clean uh, install build test uh, speed basically went down to around 20 minutes, which was acceptable. Actually, it was mainly because uh, I did the, the parallel install. NPM supports that. You can run it you know, throw like eight to whatever you want threads, and, and it works. And cutting those, you know, seconds uh, from it. Ooh, at around 97 modules, and PM5 was released. So again, uh, the, you know, the, the install was, was growing by, by a bit, the more modules you add, but then it went to like 15 minutes. 
So this is what I talk about, like free food. I didn't have to do anything, and then guys and gals, you know, did, did their work. And I had another relief to just concentrate on business logic and not work on the tooling. Sorry. Um, but I wasn't happy at the time, still. Uh, because, you know, you, you write more, more features, uh, new requirements come in. Um, for example, initially, none of the modules had a build step. Because I didn't need it. It's a node thing, and I was using uh, writing uh, JavaScript code and syntax that was supported by that node version to make my life easier, basically, and not have any transpilation. But then some of the modules had to be uh, universal. I need a build step. My tool is not supporting it. I have to go to you know to 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 write code in my tool, publish it, then I need to install it, and only then I can use it, and it kind of started getting really annoying. And I didn't really want it to support it that much, and uh, Lerna was really, was, was kind of really mature at that time, uh, and I did a rewrite. And actually the rewrite was basically throwing away a lot of code, uh, and, and using Learners uh, build up for module discovery, top of sorting, execution, and everything, and adding just a thin shim of it on it to be able to script stuff. So, whenever you know, uh, also Learner didn't support incremental builds and some stuff, but basically, I, so I solved it by, by making Learner scriptable and being able to, to you know, write whatever I care for. So th this is kind of uh, how the learner JS file looks like, and and there is not really any original code. These are just wrappers for what learner already uh, has. Uh, but again, so I really you know I threw away a lot of code. We had same capabilities, uh, and and uh, I could now experiment and iterate much faster. For however you know my uh, monorepo and modules were changed, so you know without any touch on learner script, I could like change my pull request build four times or something, as support for documentation generation, and and do a lot of stuff and iterations. And then at about from 1.4 to 1.30 modules uh, in Wix. So in Wix, uh, we have, uh, basically, uh, we exceed the number of Git repos that uh, GitHub uh, organization supports. It's, I, I don't know the number, does anybody know? It's 1,500 or something. So uh, at some point, and due, due to some other reasons, uh, in Wix we decided to kind of move to monorepos. So there is like, you know, a, a team, they move their stuff to a single repo. And I had to do the same. So uh, at that time, I had to add some free floating modules uh, to, to my monorepo. Wait. And it started getting, you know, it went like, uh, led to a slowdown where I wasn't comfortable again. But it turned out I did something right along the way. Uh, and Learner has a nice uh, feature, hoist. What it means is if uh, modules in my graph, for example, use uh, Mocha, right? Uh, and use the same version across all the modules, uh, it doesn't install Mocha in all the modules, but in the root node modules folder once per monorepo. And uh, node module resolution works in a really simple way. Uh, if I require mocha in my code, uh, it first looks up into node modules from current working directory. If it doesn't find, it goes up to the root of file system and then to the globals. So this feature actually allowed me, and I was already managing all the versions, to cut the npm install speed from 15 minutes to 2 minutes without writing any code. Um, I 
I knew about this feature before. I didn't use it uh, for good reasons, but now I started. <laughs> and I did some, some workarounds I can talk about later. Now, it was, it was kind of uh, an interesting you know, journey with these many modules and breaking up stuff. Uh, there were many times when I, when I asked myself, was it the right decision? Because you see, you know, there was a lot of stuff I had to write, there were like really annoying times when it's slow. Uh, and would I do it again? Um, I think I would. Because even without, you know, this, this, this decomposition to small, small, small pieces, I think I would end up with something like 10 to 20 modules, which still you have to manage. Uh, and, and I would still have to have something to work with it. Uh, but uh, otherwise, there was just, just, just one takeaway from me, you know, which, which like one rule and, uh, that, that I follow in many things uh, in, in my daily job, that, you know, in anything you do, the system is talking to you. Uh, be it, you know, there is your production is breaking, uh, your CI is breaking, or you know you, you wake up in the morning and your back hurts, uh, and you, you just have to listen to it, you know, uh, and and actually act. So this is the, the only thing that, that I did. You know, the system was talking to me that something was painful, slow, or or just plain annoying. I listened to it, I worked with it, and you know I solved it. And now, uh, again, I really don't regret going this extreme way, uh, and I guess I would just do it again. Thank you. Question? Yes. Yeah, so imagine a use case if you have uh, one model, then you pump a major version, uh, for example, version 2 to version 3 and after some time you still have to maintain the version 2 and you need to fix a bug in it and release 2.01 for example. Yes. Uh, what's the workflow if you use a monorepo with lots of, do you create a branch with, I don't know, version 2 and model name and more? So, um, our environment, you know, in which I work, right? So in Wix, we have continuous integration and delivery. There is no old supported versions. Basically, we, we just move forward. So if you change your interface API of some module, everybody needs to update their code as soon as possible. Uh, basically, yes, because most of the code is integration. For example, so uh, one example would be uh, we have RPC, remote procedure call, right? So, so like JVM services can talk to, to uh, node services can call JVM services, right? And there is some contract that we have. Uh, so we always have to be on the latest because, you know, if I stay behind, JVM kind of ups the contract or changes requirements and I, I'll just stop working. So we, we have this limitation that it's always latest and whenever I push, put, push change, uh, my clients, whoever using it, also kind of build. They are in the same graph actually in our CI. Yes. Yeah, so your modules have different versions, right? Yes. Okay, so if you need to make an atomic change, which spans through multiple modules, so you need to bump the version for each model, right? Um, yes. So basically, it would be some, something like juggling version. You, know, you bump one version, you fix uh, another module, then those modules depend, uh, sorry, uh, they, they have dependencies on another modules, and then you, like, you have to play with versions, like bumping up the versions for, for the whole basically tree if you uh, change something in very, very low level module. 
right? Yes. So, uh, what, what I'm asking actually, wouldn't wouldn't be better to keep the one version for uh, all the modules if you are not supporting the old version? Keeping where? Like the, just a single version for the whole model. Yeah, but I need to publish it, right? Yeah, but then you would publish uh, with the, no, when you, when you make your changes uh, and then you would just bump the master version and you would basically update the version for the whole uh, model repo. So you mean like all the models have a single version, I, I, I yeah. up it yeah. and they just yeah, pub publish just without the build because as you said, it's pretty fast. Wouldn't it be easier? Because right now you need to play with versions. You always need to know what changed in the graph. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't because it's it's auto incrementing, okay. right? So so I, I don't need to think. I just push. Uh, you know, I don't know actually now the versions of my models because the patched version is upped. So if I you know if it rebuilds, I just don't care. Um, This this might actually work. What you know, uh, the the sad thing is that uh, I'm not sure I could make the, the publish action atomic. So if I you know so I the, there is one version two on my old modules, right? Uh, I build them. It's all nice and dandy. I want to publish them, and then in the middle of something, uh, registry like becomes flaky. So I publish some partial of it and now I would I mean it's workable I guess I would need to figure out the logic how to determine and you know I either run com compensation or publish just what wasn't published um, I guess that, that is you know just another way to, to, to go around it yes but is it something that often in your job that, that you need to make multiple changes like the, the changes for multiple models like with yes. one commit, you Yes, yes, a lot of those. I mean, uh, so so there are like many, uh, I would call it internal modules, right? So the, the bootstrap thing is composed of many modules, which uh, my like clients, other developers, do not explicitly NPM install. They are just as dependencies. So those I, I consider as, you know, I break them whenever I feel like it. I don't respect the contracts. For the public, I have to, backward compatibility. And I do really like many, many changes are spanning across multiple models. At least two, three, for example. Not like whole, you know, graph or something, but yeah. Any more questions? No. Thank you.